nature, trees, flowers, fresh air. Felt like um, I had the flow. I was tired, uh, muscle pain. A comfortable home, a safe place for the kids, every family's dream. I was dropping things and uh, my fingers and toes were sore. I was dizzy all the time. My eyes and head and legs hurt. But sometimes danger lies hidden in the serene landscape. I had this thing that had bitten me. I wasn't afraid of it. Uh, I didn't think it could do anything. A tiny tick hitches a ride on a chipmunk, deer, squirrel, or bird and is brushed off onto a passerby. Its bite can cause Lyme disease. Lyme disease does not discriminate. It affects people of every age and every occupation. You can get it while traveling and even in your own backyard. Cases have been reported from across the country costing society over one billion dollars each year. Lyme disease can seriously disrupt lives. This is the story of three families whose lives were forever changed by this mysterious illness. For one, it meant the loss of more than $400,000. For another, the loss of almost a year's work and early retirement. And one family paid the ultimate price, the loss of a child. The Forstners never imagined that the tick bite Karen got early in her pregnancy might affect the well-being of their baby. Karen had a difficult pregnancy. She developed a rash, joint swelling, and pain. But it wasn't considered serious, so she and Tom eagerly anticipated the birth of a normal, healthy child. I remember it very vividly. It was a beautiful sunny day in July. We were terribly excited because he was our, our first and only son. And he was my only blood relatives in, in the world that I knew of. I was adopted, and I didn't have any blood relatives at all. Here's Jamie. When Jamie was born, it was a breeze. The labor didn't hurt at all. The next thing I know, I had this wonderful baby. He looked perfectly normal, and everything, he had all the fingers and toes he was supposed to have, and everything was there. I kept saying, I'd like to hold him, I'd like to hold him. And they rushed him off. They called me and said, there's something wrong with him, that he appears to have a brain infection, and we are going to do a spinal tap. Um, and that was the beginning of a very scary number of years. I don't think we hardly slept at all the first six weeks. In fact, I don't think we slept much at all the first six years. And I was under the impression that, you know, what we were going through was normal. But he had these eating problems and swallowing problems, and he had massive vomiting on a regular basis every day maybe 30 40 times a day anything he ate would come right back up and what we ended up doing is we cared for him 24 hours a day it was just constant up and down and up and down and then he would be in the hospital for pneumonia and he'd get antibiotics then he comes home and the pneumonia's all over with and he's starting to do much better and over time he'd get sick again and his eyes would cross, he'd have shaking things starting again, and he'd go back into the hospital. It was like you were constantly getting your son back on track and slowly losing him again and getting him back on track. Um, it, was, it was awful. At one point, I went to lunch with one of the partners at the firm, and they said, look, you're going to have to make a choice. It's either your family or your job. And in an instant, I said, that's it. I'm done. I'll leave the firm. There comes a time, I think, in everybody's life that you have to make a basic decision on who you are and what you're going to be. And for us, it was going to be helping Jamie at all costs. That means if we lost our house, lost the ability to have any possessions, if we had to give up our jobs, we were going to do it. I went down to the medical library uh, at a medical school by us, and I bought 
10 medical books. And I started looking at them, and I put all of our son's medical history out on the floor. And I saw that our son had this facial thing that we called the handicap look. It's called Bell's palsy. And in the book, it had this big picture. And I recognized that that's what was happening to our son. I looked at the book, and underneath it, it said one of the causes was Lyme disease. So I started looking through the other books and found that Lyme disease can cause some brain problems and some other kinds of problems, some muscle tone problems. And I started putting all of that together. And I realized that he probably had Lyme disease, and so did I. Lyme disease is an infectious illness. It's caused by a bacteria. It's a kind of a bacteria called a spirochete. It's transmitted by the bite of a tick gets into the person's skin and tissues and their bloodstream, and then gets carried to all parts of the body. The ticks are very small, small creatures that can give a bite that's totally painless and unnoticed. And that's why many people who never expected they even had a tick bite end up showing up with Lyme. Lyme is now a very well-recognized widespread illness, and it has been found and reported in at least 48 of our states. Brian Morrissey moved from the city to the suburbs to provide a better life for his family. Within three weeks of moving, he developed Lyme disease. I was walking around my property with a couple of different landscapers getting some quotes on doing some landscaping work for me. And uh, within a week of doing that, I developed uh, flu-like symptoms, uh, rash, 104 fevers. Uh, it was like uh, I got hit by a locomotive train. Brian exhibited the typical signs and symptoms of Lyme disease, a rash and flu-like feelings. He was treated with antibiotics, but to this day, he still suffers from relapses. Occasionally after tick bite, when the bite transmits Lyme disease, a patient can develop a bullseye rash. And this rash is usually round to circular oval, can be expanding over time, often is red with um, a distinct margin, and usually doesn't feel like anything and may itch may not itch at all, and may be present for several weeks. New research has proven that the bullseye rash is not the most common Lyme rash. Lyme disease rashes can take many shapes, sizes, and colors. Some people get multiple rashes. However, some people never get a rash at all. Each member of my family, with the exception of one of my uh, daughters, uh, got sick, and each one of us had very, very different symptoms. And how'd you do with the doctors yesterday? Initially, really all I had was, was, you know, joint pain, which I wrote off to, uh, you know, playing football, being sore, that kind of thing. And then a, a couple of months after the season ended and I noticed that I was still sore and it was getting worse, uh, you know, I went up to a doctor who did diagnose me with Lyme disease. I started to uh, have trouble with word retrieval, um, attention deficit problems. I had a hard time focusing. I felt like... Um just very tired and um, I had really never been sick so this strange summertime flu was like a red light going off so I immediately went to a doctor and um, he gave me three weeks of medication and um, I felt a whole lot better and he gave me a blood test which turned out to be negative. By then I had started to do some research and I found out that a negative test does not rule out Lyme disease. Uh, a person can test negative and still be infected. A Lyme patient can present to the physician with many symptoms of Lyme and even a history of a tick bite and a rash and the blood test would not show. So we call that a false negative. So in Lyme disease, a false negative blood test as well as a false positive can exist. Lyme disease is not only hard to diagnose, it's sometimes misdiagnosed. I was the canine officer with our local police department. I also enforced laws pertaining to all the wildlife, livestock, domestic animals. So I was in the field with the animals of all different types. It wasn't unusual for me to get any kind of bite, be it uh, horse flies, fleas, ticks, um, you know, llama bite. <laughs> it was no laughing matter. Sal Cretella had Lyme disease and didn't know it. I was very weak, I was tired, uh, muscle pain, uh, dizzy, nauseousness. I would sleep 12, 14 hours a day. Just picture the worst flu-like symptoms, and that's what I 
had every single day. It just didn't disappear. And I was just a basket case. Diagnosing Lyme by symptoms is very tricky. Lyme is called the great masquerader. In other words, none of the symptoms other than the rash are specific for Lyme disease. I was tested for multiple sclerosis, uh, AIDS, uh, brain tumors. Uh, I had EEGs, EKGs, CAT scans. Lyme disease can be mistaken for arthritis, can be mistaken for heart disease, can be mistaken for neurologic diseases, and can even be mistaken for psychiatric problems. I couldn't work any longer because of the symptoms. I could no longer feel good about driving, carrying a weapon, answering complaints, being a public safety officer. At that point, I was just too sick to perform my duties. Uh, and I was out of work for 11 months. Come here. I was home sick when uh, the results came back, and the doctor told me that uh, you know, I had Lyme disease. And at that point, I felt like a, just a rush of relief that finally there's a name attached to what I'm suffering from. I was treated for two and a half years with antibiotics. Nine and a half months of it was IV therapy. And it worked. The key to successful treatment of Lyme disease is early recognition and early treatment. I did a statistical study and found that the longer the amount of time goes between proper diagnosis and treatment from the time the infection was first acquired, the more difficult it is to treat that person, the more treatment they need, and the higher the likelihood of relapses or treatment failure. We don't know that Jamie would have ever, ever been normal, even if he were treated right away. We have no idea. Clearly, I believe he would have been a lot better off. When you let a bacteria run for two years before you can aggressively go after it, that's got to cause problems. At nine months, Jamie had muscle tone, could see and hear, and was starting to talk. I love you. Jamie, can you see Daddy? As time passed, he suffered severe setbacks and required frequent hospitalizations. His physical deterioration was devastating. We had um, a nurse come out to the house to help evaluate what kind of services that we would qualify for for parents of a now multi-handicapped child. And she said to us that he would require such extensive nursing care and medical care that she recommended we give him up for adoption. That there would be all sorts of things that as parents we couldn't provide for our son that another family that he didn't know could do for him because the state would provide for free all sorts of medical care and equipment. The financial part we were willing to put up with. We lost our house, we lost our house, we really didn't care, we already lost all our savings. We were lucky that we had health insurance. Um, we maxed out one policy and ended up going to another health insurance policy and just about had maxed that out. We were dancing as fast as we could to try to find solutions to problems that we had never imagined we could possibly encounter. I was a pretty good student before Lyme disease. Uh, I took the SATs in seventh grade and scored pretty well on them. Um, now, school's much more of a struggle than it had been. My finals, uh, I bombed most of them. I bombed an open book math final. A big part of Lyme disease from a patient's point of view is the fact that they can become confused and forgetful and their mind is fuzzy and they just don't focus well. And you know, if you do an x-ray, even a CAT scan or an MRI, most of the time they're normal, but the patients don't feel well. We now have a technique, it's a brain scan called a SPECT scan, and it actually takes a picture of what's going on by mapping the flow of blood. And lo and behold, in the patients with Lyme disease who have all these brain symptoms, you can actually see in a picture the abnormalities that correspond to their symptoms. In some cases, the symptoms of Lyme disease are painfully obvious. Victims can suffer from Bell's palsy, crippling arthritis, and heart problems. And we have found that the bacteria that causes Lyme can hide from host defenses and hide from the effects of antibiotics by living deep in tissues, within the eye, even within the cells themselves, places where antibiotics have a difficult time reaching and working. There's no universally 100% effective treatment for Lyme disease, especially the established advanced case of Lyme. 
every morning and every evening, I uh, help supervise my 16-year-old uh, son doing his IV infusion. Yeah, a little. Every evening, I have to infuse my daughter uh, because she just can't access the IV apparatus herself. Um, and every morning and uh, every evening, uh, my six-year-old uh, has to try to choke down and swallow uh, four to five different pills. Nobody really fully understands the, um, what it's like to live with this disease. Um, how, you know, some days you're okay and some days you're not. Um, and how um, it takes so long to get better. It's frustrating as a big brother watching, you know, Kevin especially, how he talks about, you know, IVs and doctor's appointments as if they're everyday life. You know, when, when I was that age, I didn't even know, know what they were. It's kind of cast a shadow over just, you know, every, everything we'd like to do, everything, you know, we used to do. The dream was never about a house or living in a beautiful community. The dream was to raise a family. And we were blessed with four beautiful, healthy, wonderful children and we devoted ourselves into not just giving them material things we made a conscious effort to make these children whole the parents are supposed to be able to take care of things make things better uh, one thing i found out with this is that nobody really knows the answers um, and it's just a matter of helplessness where you know there's something wrong with your wife or your children um, and there's nothing you can do about it i see it as a physician i see cases that just break my heart um, people who weren't diagnosed properly, weren't treated early enough, and they just became so sick. And you know, the tragic part also is that these people often look fine, yet they're hurting, they're confused, their life is just destroyed. When Jamie was five, he was successfully mainstreamed into kindergarten. The more normal things that we could do with him, the more we enjoyed it. And kindergarten was the most normal thing he ever did. He went on a special bus, and we got to see a regular school bus come to our house and take our son off to school. I mean, something we never even dreamed of. And the, the kids were just wonderful. They really took him under their wing, made him part of the group, and it made him feel great. I think my favorite part was the um, birthday party he got invited to, that a lot of other kids, I guess, when they're young, get to birthday parties. But he had never been invited to one. One of the girls in his class felt he should come to hers. And it was a marvelous day. Of, it was like a slice of life that everybody else has. We were enjoying. He went off on a class trip once. Yeah. And it was right. just, our son went on a class trip. I mean, it, for everybody else, it's just probably normal. It's like taking a step. But for Jamie, this was a really, really big, exciting thing. He went on a bus. They went to the city. They saw a show. And it was just, it was fabulous. Shortly before his sixth birthday, Jamie Forschner died during a relapse. An autopsy found the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Many of Jamie's classmates attended his memorial service. When someone dies, when you lose a child, you're never prepared for grief. Nobody talks about dying, um, and certainly not with Lyme disease. But it does happen, sometimes. After the, the funeral and everything, we came home. And we had been with people the entire time. They, they never let us out of their sight. And when we were home and all his stuff was still there, and there was just such a void, such an emptiness, um, such, such a vacuum that, you know, you just knew that, that that would never be filled again, that he was gone and that's all there was. In the years that Tom and Karen were fighting for Jamie's life, they had also given birth to the first nonprofit organization dedicated to finding solutions to Lyme disease and other tick-borne disorders. The Lyme Disease Foundation accomplishes this through education, research, and advocacy. 
The LDF has a wide range of educational materials for school children, adults, and the medical community. The Foundation's research efforts have resulted in numerous publications and discoveries. At the outset of the hearing, Karen testified before Congress and was instrumental in securing the first targeted federal funding for Lyme disease education and research. I that my most important role that I've ever had was as Jamie's mom. Karen is also the author of Everything You Need to Know About Lyme Disease. In 1997, the Lyme Disease Foundation received a prestigious award for outstanding educational effort from the National Institutes of Health. The Foundation has made a tremendous difference for patients because what I feel what we've done is we've given them access to information so they can get themselves diagnosed, given them, given them access to physicians who are aware of the disease and are able to treat them in a more uh, efficient manner. And also we've made an awful lot of difference in terms of promoting research. The most important protective measure against Lyme disease is education. People need to know that Lyme exists, that it's not a simple illness or that it's a joke, that it's a very serious problem. I don't tell my people or my friends or my family, don't go out into the woods. I want them to be educated, learn to protect themselves, but you have to enjoy the world. You can't stay indoors. Don't let Lyme disease make you a prisoner of your house. Prevention of Lyme disease and other tick-borne disorders is up to you. Remember to dress properly. Wear light-colored clothes so you can more easily see ticks. Tuck shirt into pants and pants into socks so that ticks stay on the outside of clothes. Use EPA-approved tick repellents. Do frequent tick checks on yourself, family, and pets, and remove attached ticks properly. I worry about my family getting Lyme disease, but thankfully there's a lot more information out there and we can now be more aware of it. There's no reason to be afraid to go out in the woods. There's no reason to be afraid to go hiking or bicycling. My son's played football out in the backyard and my daughter wrestles out there with me. We do careful inspections when we take a shower and we have tick repellents that we use. And it's become second nature with my daughter. Uh, if she's going out in the field to play, she'll automatically come, you know, I need the tick repellent. Yeah. It's there. Be aware of it. Look for ticks. Don't be afraid to go out in the grass. And don't be afraid to look for answers for treatment. I think that our whole family has progressed from where we were last year, which is encouraging. It's a very slow process, though. Uh, it's a lot of two steps forward, you know, one step back, sometimes one step forward, you know, two steps back, uh, which is frustrating, but I think that eventually we all, you know, we all will be better, and I think eventually, you know, we'll be able to put this behind us. Two years after Jamie died, the Forchners were blessed with an unexpected surprise. I get a phone call. I'm out of the office at a dentist appointment. My husband gets the phone call. I come into the office, there's a big sign up, and it says, congratulations, you're pregnant, and these flowers, this whole bouquet of roses on my desk, and this big sign he had made um, that we were going to be parents all over again. And Chrissy was born a little bit early, huge, healthy, screaming like crazy, full of muscle tone, full of personality and has been off to the races ever since. And the only reason we lose sleep now is because we're working overtime at the foundation or because we can't get her in bed. But it's just wonderful. Let's go.
The most disturbing thing is that Lyme disease is perceived as just a number happening to one person. But it's not a number. It's a person's whole life, and it's everybody around them. It's their fathers, it's their mothers, it's the kids, it's the dogs, it's their family, it's their income, their insurance company. It affects everything around them and everything around their loved ones. Our tangible losses so far include one year of school, the 11 weeks she spent in the hospital, $145,000 worth of medical expenses, and a one-year leave without pay from my teaching job. One thing that was very difficult for me was when I could no longer work. That I completely lost my sense of self. I lost my identity, and I became very, very depressed. Every day is a new day, and that's important. That's something that I think everyone with Lyme disease needs to hear. Alicia has gotten past it. Alicia's very much in the moment, and now that she's feeling better, she really wants to move on. We never would be where we were today if it weren't with the help of the Lyme Disease Foundation and uh, numerous conversations that I've had with many, many Lyme disease patients, uh, support groups, and ultimately a wonderful doctor. Uh, without him and without all the help, Shep never would have survived.